It is good to be with you to study together again tonight. I hope you're all doing well and having a good week so far. I hope to see you this coming Sunday, either at 9 o'clock or at 1030 at one of those two services. If you can attend in person, I hope you can sign up on the Sign Up Genius account. If you need any help with that, get in touch either with me or with Kenna, and we would be more than happy to help you through that process. Uh, tonight, we continue with our study of the book of Acts. Acts, of course, was written by Luke, the beloved physician, and he is writing to a man by the name of Theophilus, either a recent convert or somebody that he's trying to convert to the Christian faith. And this covers the period of history from the establishment of the church for about 30 years. So it spans the ministry of Peter and John, and then it moves into the ministry of Paul the Apostle. So that's what we're dealing with. And we're working our way through the book of Acts. Up to this point in the book, we've looked at the first seven chapters. In the ABCs of Acts, we summarized chapter 1 with the word ascension. We then moved into chapter 2, the beginning of the church. In Acts chapter 3, we saw a man carried by his friends, laid down at the temple gates, healed by Peter and John. And so the summary is carried and cured. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested and threatened by the council to stop preaching about Jesus, but they are determined disciples, so they continue in Acts chapter 5, we have the empty jail as Peter and the other apostles are arrested and then let out of jail by the angel, and then they immediately go back to preaching. We summarize chapter 6 with the words, first deacons, but always with the question mark. Seven men were appointed to, the, uh, to take care of the feeding of the Greek-speaking widows. They do the work that deacons seem to do, but they're never directly given that title explicitly. In Acts chapter 7, one of those servants, a man by the name of Stephen, continues preaching and teaching. He does an amazing job outlining all of Jewish history, but Stephen becomes the first martyr of the church, stoned to death for the Christian faith. And so Stephen, therefore, is a great hero. We then transition from Acts 7 into Acts 8 as we are introduced to a young man by the name of Saul. He holds the coats of those who stone Stephen. And then he leads a widespread persecution of the church. He chases people down just for being Christians. He drags them back to Jerusalem. In response, the early Christians run, but they preach the gospel as they go. So they are fulfilling Jesus' command to go into all the world, uh, preaching from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth, as Jesus outlined and predicted in Acts 1 verse 8. Last week then, we looked at one of those men who fled due to the persecution, one of the seven servants, a man by the name of Philip. Philip uh, flees to Samaria where he preaches Jesus and where large numbers of men and women were believing and being baptized, including a former magician by the name of Simon. When Simon sees the apostles giving people the ability to perform miracles through the laying on of hands, uh, Simon tries to purchase this power. He is condemned by Peter and he is told to repent and then to pray in order to be forgiven. Well, tonight we move along and we get to the second half of Acts 8 as Philip is given a new assignment. In the ABCs of Acts, we are summarizing Acts 8 with the question, how can I? Hopefully that'll make sense in a few minutes. But as we study, if you find something better, some other way of summarizing chapter 8 by using the letter H, uh, please let me know. But for now, we start with the first half of our text for tonight, Acts 8, verses 25 through 33. So Acts 8, 25 through 33. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this, he was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation, for his life is removed from the earth? 
In verse 25, Peter and John solemnly testify and speak about, or they speak the word of the Lord. Uh, I don't remember noticing this before, but they testify. It's almost as if they are under oath in a court of law. What are they testifying to? Well, Luke doesn't nail it down here, but I would imagine they are testifying about the resurrection. As we're learning in our Sunday series, the resurrection changes everything. And so when they go up to Samaria, they make sure to give their eyewitness testimony. And they also speak the word of the Lord. And they do this on their way back as well to many villages of the Samaritans. So they take full advantage of their travels and then they head back down to Jerusalem. As this is happening, we find in verse 26 that an angel speaks to Philip and tells him to get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. A few things to note here, starting with the reminder that angels never tell people directly what to do to be saved, but they sometimes arrange the meeting between someone who's willing to teach and someone who is willing to hear. And that's what we see here. Uh, we're not aware of angels working in this way today. Uh, but it seems as if we are on pretty safe ground if we are always aware of opportunity. So that's the way we could play Philip's role here. Uh, always being willing to share the gospel with the people we know and love, the people we run into. So our job is to get the word out. And so in that sense, we're similar to uh, Philip and what he's doing here. Um, just a thought question here. Without the angel intervening here, uh, what do you think the chances are that Philip and the eunuch would have ever run into each other? They're from different cultures, different nationalities, different ethnicities. Uh, they're at least 60 miles apart, even when they are the closest to each other geographically. One is on foot, one is in a chariot, one is a government official, one is just a guy. Uh, and so the chances are basically zero, and yet the angel arranges the meeting between these two men. Another note on this verse, most of us know that we are heading toward a baptism here. Uh, spoiler alert, sorry about that, I should have given that before, but uh, some have seen the word desert and they've tried to suggest that there must not have been enough water in the desert for a baptism. Therefore, baptism isn't really necessary or it doesn't have to be a, uh, an immersion or something like that. I know I've heard that argument a time or two through the years. Uh, however, when we look into the, the word that Luke uses here, he uses a word that is translated most often by far simply as wilderness. And it just refers to an isolated or a deserted place, a solitary place. I know today when we hear the word desert in English, what do we think of? Well, I think of Arizona, New Mexico. I think of the Sahara Desert. I, you know, I think of um, hundreds or thousands of miles of sand in all directions that it being 120 degrees or whatever. Uh, but that is not necessarily what this word means. It might refer to a place like that, but it might just refer to a wilderness. So this is not necessarily a desert desert, but this is some kind of wilderness area. And so the question is, can we find enough water for a baptism in a wilderness area? And in this case, yes, it's not necessarily a dry place, uh, but it's simply a wilderness of some kind. Uh, even in deserted places, I think all of us have seen some uh, unique procedures for baptisms. A few weeks ago, I shared a picture in our Sunday morning worship service uh, of a barrel baptism over in the Philippines. And so the preacher was there and this woman got in the barrel, 55 gallon drum, and he kind of helped dunk her under the water there by squatting down. Uh, I've seen pictures of baptisms in the military in Iraq where they uh, stack a bunch of sandbags up in a square. I saw a picture yesterday looking it up online of a box, big ba box area, maybe four by four feet. Uh, made out of MRE boxes, the meals ready to eat. And so they stacked those up four or five feet high and then lined it with a piece of clear plastic and they filled it up with water right there in Iraq a number of years ago. And they were able to do a baptism in that way. Uh, I've seen a picture of a baptism on, a, on an aircraft carrier in the middle of the ocean where they filled up some of those large boxes that uh, some kind of bombs or missiles came in. And so they opened up that box. It was made out of fiberglass or plastic or something. They filled that up with water and were able to do a baptism in that way. Uh, in the Southwest, I remember seeing a picture of the baptismal pickup truck in the Navajo Nation, I believe, where they used a pickup truck with a tarp in the back and they filled it up with water. And so if somebody in the area wanted to be baptized, we would drive the truck to that area, uh, line the bed with a, a tarp, fill it up with water, and they can do it from there. And so I'm just making the point that if somebody wants to be baptized, we can find the water. 
uh, pretty much anywhere we are on this earth. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. But I wanted to mention that now because of the word uh, desert in this verse. In verse 27, Philip obeys. He goes. And I always find this interesting. Philip is in the middle of something really good going on up in Samaria. He's preaching and teaching. Many men and women are being baptized. Um, Philip is good. He's a good preacher. He's doing a good work. His work is very productive. Good things are happening. And yet I find it interesting that God sees fit to take him away from all of that and to send him in the middle of nowhere to preach the gospel to one man. From a purely human point of view, this makes no sense, does it? From a human point of view, as as elders today, we would not have said, Philip, leave what you're doing and go to the desert to talk to this guy. That does not seem like a good use of resources, but God has a plan here. And so Philip, he obeys, he gets up, and he goes. Uh, meanwhile, many, many miles away, there is this Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man is a treasurer. Uh, this is an extremely important position. Here in the United States, we don't have a treasurer right now. The office has been vacant since January. Uh, under normal circumstances, though, the treasurer's signature would be all on all of our paper money. And many of us, if you looked at a dollar bill, uh, you've seen the treasurer of the United States and his or her signature on that currency. That's a lot of signatures. That's a full-time job signing all that money. Uh, but my point is, this man is an important government official. And he's serving under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. As I understand it, Candace is not a proper name. To us, it's a proper name. We think of it in that way. Uh, but it's more of a description or a title similar to Pharaoh. Pharaoh was not a uh, some guy's first name. It was more of a description of the office that he held. Um, in Ethiopia at that time, the term referred to the sister of the king. The sister being the one who would give birth to the next king. At least that's uh, what some of what I was reading was saying. And so she was something of a queen mother. And this man, a eunuch, is in charge of all of her treasure. So a very important position that he has down there. And we find in this passage that he had come up to Jerusalem to worship. And so he is apparently a Jewish convert of some kind. Or maybe he's just interested in learning more. But this is where him being a eunuch, I believe, is relevant. Uh, under the law of Moses, eunuchs were not allowed in the actual temple. And so we learn from that that this man had traveled perhaps close to a thousand miles or perhaps many more for worship. But when he gets there, he's only able to enter the outer courtyard at the most. And I would think that would be rather disappointing if you travel a thousand miles to um, do something like that, only to not be allowed inside. I plugged it into Google Maps a few days ago looking for the distance from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, and they gave a figure of just over 2,500 miles. I did not think that it was that far. In my mind, it was maybe a thousand miles, um, you know, but I guess depending on where you're leaving from or where in Ethiopia you were going. And I've always found this interesting. Would we travel a thousand miles to worship or 2,500 miles for worship, knowing that we couldn't even go inside? once we got there. That's a long trip. That's a, that's dedication on his part. Um, if we needed to travel a thousand miles today or 2,500 miles today, how would most of us travel? Well, I think on the upper end of that, most of us would probably fly, wouldn't we? Um, we might take a train, maybe take uh, some other form of transportation. I love driving. Uh, we might take a bus or something like that if we had to. We took Amtrak from Chicago to Boston just over 20 years ago. Uh, that's just around 1,200 miles, and it took 24 hours on Amtrak, just driving or uh, taking the train straight through like that. Uh, it's just over 2,100 miles from Madison to my sister's place out in Port Angeles, Washington. Uh, it takes around 31 hours of driving to get from here out there. And even in a car, we're traveling in luxury today. Um, we, we can hardly imagine traveling 2,500 miles in a chariot uh, from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, or from Ethiopia up to Jerusalem. But this is what we have here. This is a long and uncomfortable and probably, in many ways, a dangerous trip. In verse 28, we find that the man from Ethiopia is on his way home. So he's already made the trip from Ethiopia up there, and now he's turned around and heading back. And he's sitting in his chariot, and he is reading the prophet Isaiah. When I come to this reference, I think of my trips down to Tennessee for various a series of lectures down there, polishing the pulpit in August, uh, maybe the Fried Hardeman University Bible lectures in February, 
And from my point of view as a preacher, one of the great blessings in being able to go down there to those events is to actually be able to look at and purchase books. I don't purchase too many books due to the expense and the limited number of space or limited amount of space at home. Uh, but the value of going on this trip is being able to see a book and to be able to look at it before buying it. Up here in Madison, we don't have any religious bookstores anymore. You can get books online, but it's nice to see a book. It's nice to feel a book. It's nice to, uh, to smell a book, we might say, before buying it. It's nice to flip through it and look at it and try to make that decision. Is this worth buying? Is this something I would actually read? And in my mind, the treasurer has done something similar. At least the way I look at that, this from a, from a reader's point of view, he travels to Jerusalem to worship. And while he's there, there's a good chance that he buys a book or a scroll to take back home so he can learn more about the Jewish faith uh, back home in Ethiopia. And now he is reading this on the way home, the way I see it. And he's reading from Isaiah the prophet. I'm putting a picture on top of the other stuff on the screen for just a moment here to show us what this might look like. Uh, this is the great Isaiah scroll uh, found along with the Dead Sea Scrolls back in the mid to late 1940s. Uh, this is the oldest complete scroll of Isaiah that we have. It's written on 17 sheets of parchment, that's animal skin, and these are sewn together in scroll form. It is roughly 10 inches tall by 24 feet long. In this picture, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the damage on the bottom edge as it has been rolled up. That's the way it was stored. That's the way it was carried. And so we can imagine the scroll being created. They roll it up, and then like a book, they would carry it around. And you can see how one of those corners is rolled off. And then you can see how that damage progresses uh, throughout the scroll. But I share this so we could try to picture what this man from Ethiopia was reading. Uh, most likely, it was roughly 24 feet long. He could read one column at a time. He could scroll through that. Uh, this one has 54 columns, I believe, and this man was doing this not on a plane, not on a car, not on a train, but in a chariot. By the way, we scroll today, don't we? We know what this means. On long documents on a computer, we scroll. And this, of course, goes back to what the man from Ethiopia was doing and what everybody did back then. By the way, I struggle with uh, what to call this guy. I guess I should point this out now. Might as well mention this now as well as later. Uh, personally, I really wish we had his name. <laughs> I would love calling this man by his name. Someday, hopefully, we'll learn his name when we meet him face to face in the next life. Uh, we talked a few weeks ago about not referring to the guy in Acts chapter 3 as a cripple. It's not nice to call somebody that. And here, what are we doing? We're referring to this guy as a eunuch. We think cripple's bad. <laughs> Eunuch is even worse, so not good at all. And uh, I know this is pretty much all we know about the man, so this is kind of what we call him. Uh, but how strange, isn't it, to have yourself referred to in Scripture for all of eternity and to be known forever as the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, I'll often refer to him as the Ethiopian officer. Um, he was, after all, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. But anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. I always think this is a little bit strange. Uh, to always be referring to him as a eunuch. That's basically all that we know about him. Uh, anyway, as we continue with verses 29 and 30, notice it is not an angel, but it is the spirit now. So the angel had sent him. Uh, now it is the spirit. And the spirit tells Philip to go up and join the chariot. And I find it interesting that Philip and the officer probably leave two places at two different times, from Samaria, from Jerusalem, here we have Philip meeting a moving target, right? So they leave at different times from different places. They're traveling at different rates of speed. One is walking, one is uh, driving in a chariot. And not only that, but with all of this, he meets him at just the right moment. This is the Holy Spirit at work in this scenario. So as Philip comes up beside the chariot, he hears the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Uh, here's something for us to think about. If we walked up next to somebody reading the Bible out loud, if we heard somebody reading a passage from the Old Testament, would we be able to recognize the book, chapter, and verse? Maybe. Uh, hopefully. Maybe it depends on the passage. But I point that out because Philip, he definitely comes up beside the chariot. He hears what the man is reading and he recognizes it as being the prophet Isaiah. And he starts with this awesome question. 
Do you understand what you are reading? And I just want us to remember here that Jesus often taught with questions. And that's how Phillips gets started here, with a question that comes across almost as an invitation. Sometimes we need to invite ourselves into somebody's private study. At least personally, uh, I found it helpful to ask, um, do you have any questions about the Bible? Anything you've wondered about? Anything strange that, that you would like to talk about uh, from Scripture? And it's amazing how people will open up with that. And that, that's an opening to, uh, to head that conversation toward the Lord. And that's what Philip does here. He does it with a question. Do you understand what you're reading? And notice the officer responds, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And this is where we get our H in the ABCs of Acts. How can I, as some translations put it. And I know we like to think that the Bible is easy to understand. Um, oh, the Bible is an easy book. You don't need help, that kind of thing. You don't need outside sources. Um, and I, I know we would like to think that. Uh, and in a sense, the Bible is easy to understand. But it's very easy for us to say that, especially those of us who've been studying the Bible for 30, 40, 50 or more years. Um, but it seems that the officer realizes something here. Uh, he needs some help. And I think we need to realize from here that there are some difficult passages in the Bible. Uh, there are some very difficult Bible passages. We studied one this past Sunday, didn't we? The reference to being baptized for the dead. That is a hard passage. And so in Bible class, it's not a matter of saying, well, it means what it says and says what it means. Let's go to the next verse. That's, it's not always as easy as that. And so this is definitely a hard passage that this man comes to. Luke gives us the actual passage. He puts it here. If we have a Bible with cross-references and we look up the little letter by this, we find this is a direct quote from Isaiah 53. Uh, remember, in my opinion, he's most likely picked up this scroll in Jerusalem and he's reading this on his way home, scrolling through it. He's 53 chapters in. So he's 53 chapters away from Jerusalem at this point, heading toward his home back in Ethiopia. And in this passage, we have a reference to a sheep being led to the slaughter. And it's kind of weird, isn't it? it it's a gruesome picture. But the person in this scenario is silent. He's innocent, but he's also not protesting what's about to happen here. In verse 33, this person is humiliated in his death. Uh, there's some question about descendants, as I understand it. It's almost like he has died without children. And there's a question about what happens next. As a eunuch, if I could put himself, put myself in his place, I'm guessing the officer probably has some, some similar questions here. When I'm dead and gone, uh, who will remember me uh, as a eunuch not having any children? And, and so there's some, some parallels between the eunuch and whatever's going on in this passage. And so he's confused and he wants to know more. And this leads us to what happens next. So we continue tonight with uh, Acts 8, 34 through 40. This is right after the quote from Isaiah. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. In verse 34, the eunuch takes Philip's bait, in a sense, and he wants to know, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? And this right here is an age-old question among the Jewish people. Everybody wants to know, who is Isaiah writing about? Uh, even today, some uh, modern-day Jews have suggested maybe this applies to some future Messiah. Maybe this is somebody we're still waiting for. Uh, some have suggested Isaiah is writing about himself. Uh, some have suggested that the nation of Israel is the one being written about here. Um, so those are the leading theories. Isaiah, some future Messiah, or the Jewish nation. Uh, just another thought question here. Uh, when Israel is attacked these days, do they go down like a lamb led to the slaughter? Are they silent before their shearers? 
what happened just a few weeks ago when Hamas fired hundreds of Iranian rockets into Israel. The response was anything but a lamb led to the slaughter. And so I would suggest that's evidence this is not about the nation of Israel. This is not how they respond to being attacked. And so we continue then in verse 35, as Philip opens his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preaches Jesus to the man. And so Philip starts where the eunuch is, with a passage he is currently reading and interested in, and he takes advantage of that interest to point this man to Jesus. What does it mean to preach Jesus? Well, we don't have the word-for-word -word text of his sermon to this man, as we have the text of Stephen's sermon in the previous chapter. But it seems that he probably started with this passage in Isaiah, and he explained how Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Even today, we still read Isaiah 53 before we partake the Lord's Supper, don't we? That chapter is entirely about Jesus. Everything fits in an absolutely perfect way. And so he preaches Jesus based on this prophecy. There's something else that gives us a clue as to what Philip said on this occasion. And we see it in the eunuch's response. So Philip is preaching Jesus. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And so the natural result to hearing a sermon about Jesus is to want to be baptized immediately. As in, pull the chariot over to the side of the road right now, immediately. So he, <clears throat> he hears about Jesus, he sees water, and he wants to be baptized right away. So preaching Jesus, then, is the same as preaching baptism. You can't preach Jesus without preaching baptism. And when we think about it, we realize that Jesus' earthly ministry started with his own baptism, didn't it? That's how he got started. And his ministry on this earth ended with him telling his disciples to go out and baptize every person on the face of the earth, if at all possible. The ministry of Jesus on this earth started and ended with an emphasis on baptism. In fact, if you wanted to remove baptism from the story of Jesus, you would do serious damage to the story of Jesus. You'd be cutting out some major crucial parts of it. So Jesus and baptism are really cannot be separated. In verse 37, we have an issue with the text itself. Some of you might not even have verse 37 in your copy of the Bible. Some of you uh, may have a footnote with an explanation in the margin at the bottom of the page. Uh, the New American Standard puts this verse in brackets with an explanation in the margin somewhere that says, early manuscripts do not contain this verse. And I think most of us understand this. Most of us who are in this class tonight, we're familiar with this, but, but we no longer have the original manuscripts of the Bible. Uh, we don't have the book of Acts in Luke's handwriting, but instead we have copies of copies. And some of our copies of various books of the Bible are very old, uh, going back to perhaps early in the second century. Uh, but others are more recent. For the most part, all of these manuscripts are almost identical, thankfully. However, there are some very slight variations between them, as we would expect with any handwritten documents. As I understand it, all of the variants add up to less than a page in the entire New Testament. And that's amazing, especially when you consider uh, these copies of copies or copies are all handwritten. But this is one of those variants. Uh, meaning that this verse is in some manuscripts and not in some others. Well, the science of figuring out which variant is closest to the original is known as textual criticism. So our goal, using a number of techniques and resources, is generally to try to go back and to find the oldest manuscripts. And the challenge is that over time, we find older and older manuscripts. And so tomorrow, they may find a manuscript that's five or ten years older than the oldest that we have now. That would then be closer to the original. As I've often said, the deeper we dig over in that part of the world, the better it gets for the Christian faith. We're, we're constantly finding older and older pieces of the New Testament. And that's the situation we have here. When we lay out everything we have in Acts 837 and arrange all of the evidence in order of the date that it was copied, the oldest manuscripts, that is those that were closest to the original, do not have verse 37. And I'm completely oversimplifying this, but this is basically what's going on here. Or as the note in the margin says, 
early manuscripts do not contain this verse. And different translations handle that in different ways. Uh, personally, I'm glad the New American Standard Bible puts this verse in brackets uh, in the paragraph of text. Um, in my opinion, it's good to know that there's some issue here so that we know about it. Uh, some more modern translations have just taken out verse 37 completely, and so it's not even there, and they've reduced it just to a footnote. And I understand that, but I think it's best just to know about this. However your translation handles it, we just need to be aware of this. Uh, some of the older translations don't mention anything. There is no footnote in some of the older translations. And the reason is, at the time they were translated, they didn't even have the oldest manuscripts. They hadn't even been found yet. And so there was no issue with this verse yet. So some people look at the modern translations and they say, oh, they're taking out parts of the Bible. Well, not really in this case. Uh, in this case, the older we look, the farther back we go, the more accurate it gets. And it seems that the oldest manuscripts did not contain uh, verse number 37. Um, anyway, um, not a crucial thing here. I just want us to be aware of this issue, uh, mainly because if we're studying with somebody, if we're being Philip to somebody's officer, and we come to this passage as we're teaching them about baptism, we need to be aware of this. Because their Bible may or may not have it, and our Bible may or may not have it. And so, wait a minute, can I trust my Bible? What's going on here? And we just need to be aware of how to answer this question. When they say, wait a minute, our Bibles are different, we need to be able to answer that without losing faith in the integrity of the Bible itself. So here's what I'm thankful for in all of this. First of all, what we have in verse 37 doesn't contradict anything we find elsewhere in the Bible. So that's the first thing I'm thankful for. So if this is legit, it doesn't contradict anything anywhere else. But then secondly, what we have in verse 37 is actually found elsewhere in the Bible. And so, one, if we accept this verse as scripture, it's not disagreeing with anything else. But then secondly, if we conclude this verse was added later by an uninscribed, uh, uninspired scribe, maybe to explain the situation here, and that this is not actually the word of God in verse 37, what I'm thankful for is we're not losing something that is only found in this verse and nowhere else. I hope that makes sense. Obviously, confessing Jesus as the Son of God is found elsewhere. So that doctrine does not depend on verse 37. It makes sense to do it before baptism. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to baptize somebody who doesn't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's kind of the point. Now, let me know if you have any more questions or comments on this. I'd be glad to send you some more information, but we just need to be aware of that since some of you may or may not have verse 37. Uh, either way, with or without verse 37, Philip preaches Jesus, the eunuch sees water, he wants to be baptized, and now he orders the chariot to stop. And both men go down into the water, and Philip baptizes the man right there. A few more notes here, starting with the fact that we have a clue about the form or the mode of baptism, as it is sometimes described. I know today people will say, ah, baptism can be sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. doesn't really matter. Um, you can take your pick. Um, but we learn something about it here, the way it needs to be. Baptism is something that requires going down into the water and coming up out of the water in the next verse. If baptism could have involved sprinkling or pouring, they could have done it right there in the chariot without the hassle of getting fully wet in this body of water here. Uh, certainly somebody smart enough to be a treasurer of a nation would also be smart enough to travel through the wilderness with at least some water on board, right? But as it is, a bottle of water can't do it. That's not enough. Instead, they go down into the water, and then they come up um, out of the water. Now, some have had a question about uh, both going down into the water, as opposed to the way we often uh, do it at Four Lakes, where the person doing the baptism stands outside the water. We need to remember the person who is being baptized is the only one who needs to be immersed. It's not both people being immersed. It's just the one. Um, I've already, I've already been baptized back on March 18th, 1984. And so I'm just saying verse eight, uh, verse 38 doesn't prove that both people need to be immersed simultaneously, but I think it just uh, helps to show that baptism is an immersion. And if I could immerse somebody without actually getting in the water myself, uh, whether it's in a barrel or a bathtub or a cattle trough, like we've used for baptisms in our backyard at home, 
uh, the scriptures seem to approve of that. This is just an incidental detail that Philip also got in the water uh, with the man. What was important was that the eunuch is baptized. In the last two verses, they come up out of the water, and the Spirit seems to snatch Philip away and whisk him to his next assignment. So from here in the desert or wilderness over to Azotus, and then through a number of cities until he lands in Caesarea. Uh, we'll come back to this um, several months down the road because uh, in time sequence, Philip still seems to be in Caesarea 20 years later. Um, some have tried to argue that preachers need to constantly be moving, uh, almost like circuit riders. And they argue this because Paul and the others often travel. Um, but I would just point out we do have Philip here who is in Caesarea here, and then he's in Caesarea 20 years down the road later on in Acts. But again, we'll get to that in 20 years, which for us hopefully will be just a, a couple months along in the book of Acts. Uh, the eunuch then continues on his way rejoicing. As with the other conversion accounts in Acts, rejoicing never comes before baptism. We don't have people rejoicing and then being baptized. It's always being baptized and then rejoicing. And putting this all together, we know why. Baptism is the point at which our sins are forgiven. And so there's no reason to rejoice before baptism, only after. And I mention this because some today try to teach that we just need to accept Jesus into our hearts, that we're saved at that point, and then we're baptized later to join a church or to give some kind of outward sign of something that has already happened. Um, so we would then have belief followed by rejoicing, followed by baptism, if that's the way it is. Belief, rejoicing, baptism. That is not the order of things in Acts. It is belief, then baptism, then rejoicing, when all three of these things are mentioned together, and that is significant. Uh, here at the end, let's think about this for just a moment. Earlier that morning, neither Philip nor the man from Ethiopia could have ever imagined how their day would unfold. They woke up, he got on the road, Philip got this assignment, they had no idea what would happen. In the same way, we also have no idea what good we can do if we're always looking for opportunities to do good and to share the gospel. This brings us to the end of chapter 8, How Can I? How Can I Understand Unless Someone Guides Me? Uh, if you have something better than this, based on what we've studied together tonight or last week, please let me know. Uh, before we close, there is something else for us to consider. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah. We know that he makes it through Isaiah 53. Philip comes up, interrupts that reading. He's baptized. Philip disappears. The eunuch goes on his way rejoicing. What do you think the man from Ethiopia does now? He's still probably 2,000 miles from home. As he gets settled down in his chariot, don't you think he probably keeps reading? Don't you think he gets that scroll out again and picks up at the end of Isaiah 53 and continues going. Just a few miles down the road, just a few chapters later, he would have come to Isaiah chapter 56. And let's think about this from the eunuch's point of view. As a brand new Christian, maybe still dripping wet as he continues on in the chariot, he comes to Isaiah chapter 56, verses 3 through 5. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, and choose what pleases me, and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial, and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name, which will not be cut off. As a Christian, the eunuch is now wearing the name of Christ, isn't he? An everlasting name which will not be cut off. That's a blessing even better than having sons and daughters. And with this, the gospel makes its way to Ethiopia, where a powerful government official now uses his influence to spread the word about Jesus. And I believe this is why Philip is taken away from a successful ministry up in Samaria, to go talk to one man out there in the middle of nowhere. Next week, let's pick up with Acts 9 as we come to the conversion of Saul. It's an exciting chapter coming next week. You may want to read ahead, and you may want to be looking for a way to summarize Acts 9 using the letter I. 
So I've got my ideas for I, and if you have something you want to share, get in touch with me before class. I'd love to share that. Uh, but thank you for taking the time to study together with us tonight. I hope to see you for worship on Sunday, either at 9 or 1030. This would be a great time to sign up. Uh, let me know if I can help. Let me know if you have something we need to be praying about. Let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, the one and only, the Lord of heaven and earth. Thank you for saving us and thank you for giving us people in our lives who are willing and able to answer our questions. Thank you for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. Tonight we ask that you use us just as you used Philip. We pray that our paths would cross with those who are searching for answers that your word provides. Give us the wisdom we need to ask good and helpful questions, just as Jesus did and just as Philip did. Thank you for providing us with the perfect example. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.